On behalf of the World Academy of Art and Science, I welcome all of you to the International Conference on Education for Human Security. I thank everyone who has accepted our invitation and joined us online today. Special thanks to all our collaborating partners, the World University Consortium, National University of Political Studies and Public Administration Romania, SDS in Europe, the Black Sea Universities Network, the Global Futures Laboratory of Arizona State University, the Jena Declaration, UNESCO Bridges, International Anti-Corruption Academy, Force for Good, and LSE Ideas. This conference includes 32 sessions and 125 speakers. We have a short video to share with all right in the beginning, created by our HS4A Communications Manager, Dalia Alec and her team. This video shows in an impressionistic way the role of education in ensuring human security for all, and in a sense, sets the stage for all the discussions to follow. In a rapidly changing world, we all aspire to feel safe and secure. Yet for countless people around the world, this is not a reality. Conflict, poverty, climate change, discrimination, inequality and injustice threaten all dimensions of human security. Indeed, our sense of insecurity seems to be increasing. Today's threats cannot be solved by traditional education. We need education that focuses on preparing youth with the values and knowledge needed to understand the rapidly changing world they live in and the actions they can take both for themselves and for society to overcome threats and enhance well-being. But there is hope. Education that focuses on human security is a powerful tool that can transform communities and build a brighter future for generations to come. It empowers individuals, strengthens communities, and promotes peace and stability. It enhances freedom from fear, want, and indignity. At its core, education for human security is about creating a better future for all and leaving no one behind. Our first speaker today is Gary Jacobs, President and CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science. Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Janani. And I too would like to welcome our speakers, panelists for the whole conference, our partners who have made this possible and all who are participating. Look forward to working with you in the next three days. Today, humanity faces unprecedented multi-dimensional global challenges. We all are familiar with them. The recent COVID pandemic, the ongoing war in Ukraine and the fast approaching climate crisis are only the tip of the iceberg. Energy, food shortages, unmet healthcare needs, drug abuse, political instability, polarization of society, cybersecurity challenges, AI, and uh, it's a long list. And all these challenges have something in common. They're all global in, in nature. None of them can be effectively addressed by individual nations acting in isolation. In fact, none of them can be effectively addressed just by governments and international organizations alone, which is why we're here today. And all of them, of course, are deeply interconnected with one another. Humanity faces a paradox. In spite of unprecedented technological and economic achievements over the last century, in spite of $2 trillion in annual military spending now, our sense of security is actually going down. There's a growing sense of insecurity in the world among populations around the world. There's a growing human security gap between our capacities and what we're actually able to deliver to people around the world. The Sustainable Development Goals are an unprecedented response of global society to this growing sense of crisis. The SDGs were formulated to address the major challenges to human security and sustainable development at the macro level. But as we know, 
all our collective efforts up until now have been inadequate. And the gap between our goals, our targets, and what we're actually able to achieve is actually increasing. And there are many reasons for it, but one at the fundamental level, the implementation of Agenda 2030 cannot be done by nation states and international organizations alone. It requires the full participation of organizations and individuals in all sectors and at all levels of global society. We need a complementary approach that starts from the bottom and builds up. The top-down approach of government initiative must be complemented and supported by bottom-up initiatives to win the hearts and minds of humanity and spur the people of the world to action. After all, the environmental movement born in the late 60s started with people and only later was picked up by governments. This is too big a task just to leave to our international and national level institutions. Human security is a person-centered approach which seeks to address the security needs of every individual on earth. It translates the macro level objectives of the SDGs into a language intelligible and personally meaningful and relevant to the individual. And we've not been able to do that yet so far with these macro level goals. Human security is a global campaign, human security for all, which we are supporting by this act, this conference, is a global campaign initiated by the UN Trust Fund on Human Security and the World Academy of Art and Science with a long list of, uh, of, of partners as well, launched in January 2023 in order to mobilize broad global public support to close the human security gap. And this conference is being conducted in support of that campaign. Education has a critically important role to play in this effort. Education is one of humanity's greatest inventions of all time. After language, I might argue it's the most important of all those inventions because it's education that really distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Education enables us to take the collective experience of millions of people over thousands of years organize it, codify it, and pass it on to future generations so they don't have to repeat the same mistakes that we've made in the past, and they don't have to rediscover the wheel and everything that's been rediscovered up until now. But education today is confronting a growing time warp. The speed of social evolution is accelerating. Technological advances, changes, complexity, uncertainty are growing and outpacing the capacity of our educational system to keep pace. And that's why we're here today in this conference. We're compelled to ask ourselves some important questions. How well is our current system preparing today's youth and tomorrow's global citizens to understand the magnitude and complexity of the challenges confronting current and future generations? and to become effective problem solvers and contributors to overcoming the challenges they will face individually and collectively. Not just specialists in a particular work they do, but as members of society and as global citizens. This is the sixth in a series of international conferences on future education begun in 2013. It brings together 120 plus highly qualified, accomplished educators, scientists, business leaders, civil society leaders, youth leaders from a wide range of disciplines for 20 sessions of open discussion to reflect on some critically important issues and to identify practical steps that can be taken to enhance how higher education promotes human security for all. We've invited you today to help us find answers to these questions, such as, what do youth today need to learn in order to understand, act effectively in their own lives and be global citizens in these challenging times? How far are they acquiring that knowledge in higher education today? What changes are needed in content, pedagogy and delivery systems to prepare them more effectively to thrive personally? and contribute collectively? What role can each of the disciplines represented in this conference play 
in transforming higher education to more effectively promote human security for all? And finally, how and how effectively can we utilize education as a conscious catalyst and driver to accelerate global social evolution? Thank you, and I look forward to listening to all of you at this conference. Thank you, Gary. I now invite former Director General of UNESCO, Federico Mayor, to address us. Thank you very much, Madam. An important and effective campaign on this new concept of security has been promoted by the World Academy of Art and Science with the vision, and also by the World University Consortium, with the vision and guidance of Gary Jacobs, that now has been telling us what are these main guidance lines. Security of the people and of the planet. Fundamental changes are needed on the concept of security and the strategies to put it into practice. To be educated according to the Article number one of the UNESCO's constitution is to be free and responsible, free and responsible. Transdisciplinary learning to generate awareness of the present situation. The present situation, I must underline that is with irreversible threats and processes. Irreversible threats. As a biochemist, I must underline this, irreversible with uh, become the very difficult to put into practice this with the people that I like so much of the Earth Charter of the United Nations. They say, we the peoples have resolved to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of the war. It's fantastic, we the peoples, yes. But we the peoples, until very recently, did not exist. The immense majority of human beings were being born, living and dying in some square kilometers, always under an absolute male power. Now, for the first time in history, all human beings are progressively recognized with equal dignity without any discrimination by reasons of gender, ideology, beliefs, sexual sensitivity, etnia, etc. And they are able, because of the digital technology, of express themselves freely. Therefore, now, yes, now we are with the peoples and all equal in dignity, and we can express ourselves. Therefore, now we can all participate in the building up of democratic multilateralism that must very rapidly substitute the governance, present governance system, a plutocratic and uh, supremacist neoliberal system, and uh, to put in the very center of the new governance with the peoples, because of the, uh, until now, you know that because of the veto, the United Nations that has this wonderful, we the peoples, they have never been able to put this into practice because of the veto. The five members that were the winners of the Second World War have the veto, and therefore the United Nations has been uh, from the very beginning, I repeat, under this uh, immense difficulty because for mediation and for governance because they had the veto. But now we are in a, in a moment this I would like to, to tell this very clearly. We had the hope of the European Union. Ah, European Union, because Europe has been not from the point of view quantitatively, but qualitatively, there is no doubt that the European Union is very important. But uh, now you know what happens. Now what happens is that they 
have also accepted the unanimity rule. And unanimity is the antithesis of democracy. Therefore, now we are with one United Nation with veto and one European Union with veto. Ah, this is what now we must very really realize that with this two very difficult ways of overcome in order to have a democratic multilateralism governance in the world is very difficult to go ahead. And it's for the reason that I think that now more than ever is important to have this vision of human security. And this vision to be translated in higher education. Because education, according to the article number one of the UNESCO's constitution, is to be free and responsible. Now we must be free and responsible. And to be free and responsible, we must have this kind of higher education that provides us with this feeling that now we, the peoples, we must intervene. We cannot be spectators anymore. Now we must be actors, actors of our life. We must be really members of one community that at the worldwide level, with the young people, with all those that realize that now we are going to a change of era, now we can say yes. Now we the people exist because we are all equal in dignity, because we are now with the possibility of expressing ourselves. Now, now we are with the peoples and we have decided to save the succeeding generations. And we are decided to act on this terrible threat and process that are irreversible in nature for the, for the uh, environment crisis. And we are going also to realize that now, yes, now we can tell the people not anymore a territorial security. With the territorial security, at this moment, every day, we have $4 billion of investment in uh, military expenditures and uh, uh, weapons. It's impossible, this. What we must do today? Today, we must say that there is not the territorial security what really matters is the human security of those living in these territories that are so well protected. What about their health? What about their nutrition? What about their water access? What about uh, their for Now, yes, now we have a hope. And this is what I would like to tell today to this initiative of uh, uh, Gary Jacobs. Today, we have the, co the hope because we can create a new future because we must not be always living thinking that we must be always under the same uh, parameters. And so now we have a transdisciplinary approach that can tell us, yes, now you have guidance. You have the agenda 2030 to transform the world. You have the possibilities of you, the people's uh, citizenship that knows what can be the real problems if they do not follow these wise directives, now, I repeat, we can be people, some hopeful. And why? Because we can say every single human being able to create is our hope. Able to create. The capacity of creativity is the, the hope of all ours at this moment in order to change the present trends, to redress the present trends, and to tell the world that now we are going to have human security. And this means that the people will be an actor and not only a spectator of what, of what is happening in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Another former Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bukova, has been unable to join us online today but she has uh, sent us her recorded message. In the last decades, the World Academy of Art and Science has influenced immensely the shift in understanding development beyond economic growth. 
expanding the richness of human life rather than simply the richness of the economy. Thus, the World Academy advocacy for focusing on people, their opportunities and choices as a measurement of human progress was one of those critical and timely ideas embraced by the United Nations that resulted in the launch of the human development reports starting from the 90s of the last century and then with the Human Development Index. The current crisis of unprecedented intensity, the COVID-19, the war in Ukraine and the climate change brought about the imperative to mobilize decision makers, institutions and the general public around the world to promote a comprehensive, integrated, person-centered approach to enhance the security, human rights and sustainable development of people everywhere and to address all the critical issues confronting the world today, including peace, human rights, inequality, health, food, education, jobs, safe community and personal safety, energy, pollution, biodiversity, and of course, climate change. These crises and the consequences thereof has a wake up call to putting human security and well-being to the forefront of public policies. One sure path is investing in people and it starts with education. I do not have any doubts that within the security, human security for all campaign, education plays a critical role. We all know that education is the foundation of human development and our faith nowadays of human security. It is vital for our health, jobs, gender equality, the protection of the environment, risk reduction, fighting climate change, and for living together in respect for diversity. In other words, education is where our future lies, but not any education. Education that means learning, that is transformative and equitable, that embraces innovation and diversity, and that encourages creativity and possibility to make choices. Education that supports students and other learners in different areas to develop the necessary knowledge, skills, and mindsets to contribute to solving the complex sustainable development challenges and the response to the crisis our world faces. I would not pretend to exhaust all the challenges today regarding the future of education and its place in the human security for all campaign. I believe there will be very profound, deep and enriching debates during this conference. But let me just mention two important points. We need to reconfirm our commitment to sustainable development and the agenda 2030 with education and health at its heart from the point of view of human security. And this is my starting line. If we want to promote a comprehensive, integrated and person-centered approach to security. This is where the importance of goal four of the sustainable development agenda, promoting inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all comes with all its critical importance for the future. At present, the ways we organize education across the world do not do enough to ensure just and peaceful societies, a healthy planet and shared progress that benefits all. In fact, some of our difficulties stem from how we educate. A new social contract for education needs to allow us to think differently about learning and the relationships between students, teachers, knowledge, and the world. Education has long played a foundational role in the transformation of human societies. It connects us with the world and to each other, exposes us to new possibilities, and strengthens our capacities for dialogue and action. But to shape peaceful, just, and sustainable futures, education itself must be transformed. 
universities are not now, nor have ever been solely focused on preparing young people for the workforce. It is about values, it is about citizenship, about preparing young people to live in a globalized world, to respond to the challenges and to the risks, to embrace intercultural competencies. From that point of view, the role of universities is critical as their main function at the end of the day is to make significant contribution to society. And I would say in the context of today's conference, also to give young people the competencies to work for the creation of knowledge of global common. It is inconceivable today to speak about human security without considering the deeply transformative role of education and knowledge. This is why this conference is so important. I wish you good deliberations and looking forward to the conclusions of this important event. Thank you. Now I invite Kehita Shanvasal, MSM UN Human Rights Champion, Founder President Green Hope Foundation, to share your thoughts with us. Kehita Thank you, Janani, and hello, everyone. I am delighted to share this virtual space with all of you to speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. Now, in a world that is fraught with inequity and exploitation, as all of my uh, previous panelists have spoken about, if there is one catalyst that can bring about change and establish parity, it is education. Its importance is often diluted and taken for granted by those who have it, almost invariably in the developed world where the state supports mandatory, mostly free education up to high school levels and sometimes even beyond. So that is probably why encouraging students to miss out on school on Fridays seems such a unique solution to draw attention to the climate crisis. This is so typically colonial, a mindset that completely ignores the harsh reality of the rest of the world, where two thirds of the global population struggle every day for survival, where every day families prefer to force their girls into domestic chores instead of sending them to school with their brothers. Where girls have to walk miles at the break of dawn to collect a pail of drinking water and only then, if they are lucky, get to go to school. Where it is still believed that education spoils a girl's chastity and pushing them into an early marriage is at once a source of money and dilution of responsibility. So it is within these parameters that my team and I at Green Hope Foundation have been working for more than a decade now, struggling against at times insurmountable odds to overcome centuries old bias, unbelievable poverty and exploitation, and a corrupt system that has no accountability. In most of these situations, education is not only a pathway to empowerment, it provides a temporary relief from the misery that shrouds their very existence. In the refugee camps on the Lebanon-Syria border or in Kutupalong, uh, still the world's largest refugee camp that was once in the global news, but now forgotten. Our education academies are a lifeline, a ray of hope for the hundreds and thousands of children, transporting them for a few few hours into another world. Their hunger for knowledge is often more than the hunger that the intense hunger that is in their empty bellies. At the schools we operate in rural Civil War torn Liberia, girls wake up an hour early to collect their daily pot of water so that they can be at school. So isn't it then a travesty of basic human security to ask these children to miss school and strike on a Friday to solve a problem that in and of itself is an outcome of insensitive Western industrial greed. Education must break the shackles of its colonial legacy so that it 
benefits every stakeholder who is bereft of it. It must encompass both children and youth, as well as adults who never had the opportunity of going to school. And as the old adage goes, there is no age limit for learning. This is also our mantra at Green Hope Foundation, where we use our education infrastructure to cut across age barriers, providing skills-based vocational training. We ensure that our schools, our academies of hope are net zero. The communities we operate in still have no access to electricity. And so we have installed solar grids that power our schools, as well as solar streetlights that young people, as well as women and girls, now have safe spaces to pursue learning. As beneficiaries of a clean energy education platform, they then become the first proponents of a carbon neutral system. Our centers of learning educate young people during the day and become vocational training centers in the evenings for adults as sewing schools for women, facilitating their evolution into entrepreneurs in societies that have traditionally barred women from public life. In these premises, we provide skills-based training on sustainable agriculture that have created over 25,000 green jobs. Our learning programs include the pioneering implementation of agrivoltaics, a climate smart solar powered innovation in least developed countries. It promotes the dual use of land for farming and energy generation, reducing soil and water stress while increasing productivity. So all of these initiatives leverage the intersectionality of education and modern science to reduce inequity, restore biodiversity, and empower entire communities while creating a low carbon, climate smart, circular bioeconomy. Our outreach has benefited over half a million people across 28 countries. However, that is just a drop in an ocean of 8 billion people to bring innovations such as ours that are still largely driven by non-state actors. We also need robust policies and an acknowledgement of the responsibility by global powerhouses whose decades of economic greed has denuded fragile ecosystems in the global south while widening the chasm of inequity. Similar to the adoption of the loss and damage measures at COP27 that holds developed nations accountable for environmental injustice, we need possibly an extension whereby they're held answerable for education and equity as well. There is an urgent need for financial inflows to revamp and in many cases provide fresh impetus to building knowledge infrastructure in order to support non-state actors working on the ground. The pandemic has demonstrated how effective distance learning can be but one needs to first build the necessary infrastructure. Otherwise, digital dividends will continue to outpace pre-existing digital divides. And at the forefront of this change must be young people who, instead of clamoring for school strikes, must instead work towards ensuring a future where access to learning is equitable through concrete ground level actions in order to truly establish human security. Our work proves that it is possible. All it requires is a change in mindset. Thank you. Thank you, Kekashan. Our next speaker is Olivia Wiener, Principal Researcher at the University of Lisbon and Chair of the PhD in Development Studies. Olivia, please. Thank you, Janani. Thank you, everyone. And um, it's an honor to share some some ideas. So I will start with the um, with the idea that academia is known for producing and contributing to new ideas for our futures, and that we must remember essentially that ideas themselves shape very powerfully the kinds of futures that we may contemplate and engage with. And already much has been said. So. This is how much we matter in education. Um, it's We provide the basis for ideas for futures where humans and all life security will be assured or 
some other future, possibly for the planet, but without us or without life. <clears throat> so across the world and over centuries, most people in power have spent and keep spending time in one of our classrooms and university departments. And this, therefore, it seems hard to escape drawing the preliminary conclusion that we offer that what we offer and what we do not offer in the shape of education is in some way contributing to the extended crises that have already been mentioned, um, which go under different labels, such as in synchronous failures or the new uncertainty complex that the United Nations Development Programme referred to last year and the poly crises, which refers to much already said. So how we might move from being at least part of the problem to part of the solution has been the question I have struggled with over the last few years. And I'll try to share three points here. The first, which links nicely to the previous speaker's uh, comments as well. Um, let me just focus then on, on the words. I say ideas shape futures, but actually... What we offer in academia is worldviews, and this is important. Worldviews refer to encompassing a particular perception or a conception of the world, a comprehensive model of reality, which we then go out and act upon. They encompass mindsets, paradigms, ways of knowing, knowledge and belief systems that we consciously and unconsciously acquire and then act upon. They are therefore crucial in any exploration of change, or we might say in any exploration of alternative futures. And alternative futures is indeed what we desperately wish to be able to imagine. So we need to recognize the importance of what kind of worldviews we are actually teaching and the ones we are not and what that might mean. So for this reason, in our future, in our work on future uh, of education and future of universities, we emphasize the making visible worldviews. And we took the inspiration from James Baldwin, understanding that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing, absolutely nothing can be changed until it is faced. Now, he was referring to the underlying causes of racial discrimination, of hatred and violence in the United States of America. But I feel that these words apply ominously to the problem that we have succinctly called the Anthropocene, or as I said earlier, the synchronous failure and the poly crisis we have. So let us make visible those worldviews. Second offering here would be the broad themes of connecting and widening in terms of what, how, and why we teach what we teach. We need to address the limits of what we might call mutilated knowledge, a very ugly word, which I think is apt, however, to describe the knowledge that dominates most of the Western-inspired education systems and our scholarship and ethos uh, and practice because there are, there are at least, let's say, three dimensions here that I want to touch upon. The first is that we need to reconnect those disciplinary boundaries, those disciplinary arenas that we have put so much effort in developing. And we need to face the unequal power of those disciplines across the board. Much has been said about the need to promote interdisciplinarity as a necessary way of addressing the common challenges we know about. But I just wish to share the idea that on top of everything that has been said about interdisciplinarity, it is also about freedom. An idea of freedom for having to protect a presumed superiority of one discipline or worldview above another and enabling us therefore, freeing us to listen, to open, to hear other voices, other worldviews that have been asking to be heard for a very long time. A second dimension that needs reconnecting and widening is body and mind. 
because the truth is that when you enter our classrooms or walk through our corridors of knowledge, so to speak, we ask you to bring in the head and leave the body behind. We, and yet the, the human potential that we claim to be contributing to, and which is the ultimate driver of the social change we need, needs and demands to be reconnected to both, to reconnect her, um, minds and body in a way that is urgent and which has been abundantly discussed, but I like to cite a scholar and native of the Potawomptomi nation, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who says that science, Western science, polishes the gift of seeing and indigenous tradition work with the gift of listening and language. In other words, connecting the head, the body and the mind or the head and the body. We need both and therefore, and there has been much progress uh, towards this, but mainly outside the conventional mainstream education. And I think this is the second, uh, the second point I'd like to share with you and hope it will be addressed. And finally, in widening, in terms of connecting and widening um, in higher education systems and universities, we have understood now, I think, that the whole idea of the Anthropocene, where humanity is a global force of change, combines with the other understanding of the planet as Gaia, as a biosphere, as a living and common home for all of us. And that combining the idea of Anthropocene with Gaia means that we have one planet. It is the only planet that we have. And we need to understand how we can work with it and be part of it in a thriving community of life. The Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, and many other labelings demand, therefore, a wider lens and breadth of Earth and the depth of her diversity, the way we understand this, the way we teach this, and we don't teach this. Universities need to help us think globally, yes, feel the landscapes that we inhabit, and eventually act locally, just like the rest of nature that we belong to. So this would be a very large change of perspective, um, a change that we focus too little on in terms of global perspectives that are needed in many of our disciplines, including history uh, beyond nations, to embrace, for example, the history of our planet. And why that matters to us today has been abundantly proven by previous speakers already. We teach too little about the importance of our home itself and how these crises come to be and how our role in it can be turned into a role that would be much more hopeful, both for security of humanity, but I would insist uh, indeed for all life on our planet. So I will leave these three points then um, in terms of the exploration of the future of education for human security. Let us focus on the unique power and the relevance of these diverse worldviews and make them visible. Be learn to practice the honesty about our diverse responsibility for the crises and the uncertainty, uncertainty that we are in so that we can face and try and solve them. And let us act in terms of connecting and widening both what and how we learn and how we know the beautiful world that we have the gift of living on. So thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Now we have Ketan Patel, co-founder and CEO of Greater Pacific Capital and chair Force for Good Initiative. Ketan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I would like to begin by thanking the World Academy of Art and Science for setting up this conference and uh, for the so many notable speakers who, who will be sharing their thoughts with us. Thank you very much also to Gary Jacobs and um, thank you also very much for the HS4A campaign. Um, Force for Good looks at how capitalism and technology in particular and financial services can fund the gap in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how 
capitalism can be changed so that these things happen. And I would say that it's, uh, it's an enormous challenge. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the noble enterprise of leveling up the world, um, we hear so many times now from the United Nations how difficult it will be to achieve those goals and how man seems to have waged a war on nature which puts us in a position where we are very precariously going forward and the 2030 goals seem to be receding in terms of their ability to achieve them. Despite that very pessimistic outcome, perhaps it's a realistic one, HS4A, human security for all, is a very simple concept. And if we take 100 and I think it's 169 targets that underlie the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, the most sophisticated of organizations have started to grapple with how they would report against those goals, how they embrace them in their strategies, in their policies and practices, and in their funding and investments. But for the rest of the world, they remain complex and therefore very difficult to pursue and to rally people around a mission, especially because there are 17. HS4A is a very simple concept in contrast. It basically says, do we agree that we should share human security for all? And it's very difficult to disagree that one should. Underlying it are seven pillars, food security, healthcare, economic security, environmental protection, personal safety and mobility, community security and political freedom. It's difficult to argue that these things should be offered, yet populist governments around the world seem to find a good reason not to offer them to sections of the population that they disagree with in terms of policy practices, sometimes basic issues of color and creed. And so one has to say that the targets are difficult, complicated by perhaps our differences as people. HS4A is this very simple concept, and this campaign that's been launched was launched this year, earlier this year in January, at the Consumer Electronics Show, which gathers technologists from all over the world to talk about the solutions they have to solve the world's problems. In most years, they talk just about the technology, how wonderful that technology is, and how much they love it. This year, because of the efforts of the HS4A campaign, the campaign of, of the whole theme, if you like, of CES was human security for all. And so for the first time, we saw human security for all spoken of by the technologists that lead industries, the technology industry and its subsectors across the world. It provided a framework almost for the activity, these seven pillars, and a series of awards were given to people who were making breakthroughs. And we found very quickly that almost every major panel and every major speaker was looking for a way to relate their activities to human security. It is simple and it is intuitive, difficult to argue with. And people who have the values seem to want to move in that direction. And so it has this framework, but it also appeals intrinsic to our values. It also provides for these companies a framework uh, for which they can galvanize their people a mission, a purpose that is big and that is meaningful. And I think as we go through this conference, We'll be talking about that, I think, and what that achieves. Nearly three quarters of a million adults are illiterate in the world, apparently. And nearly 400 million children cannot read. Most of these are women or young girls. And so, as we've heard earlier in this opening panel, there is an enormous injustice going on where even in this day and age of global communication and travel and more capital than we ever had in human history, there is inequity across the world. Um, the positive part that we found from our study of technology and how it will help us close this gap is that 40% of the SDGs we can identify and quantify can be solved, the gap can be closed by the transfer of technology. And so there is enormous hope actually that the wisdom, the knowledge, the analytic skills, the ability to discern that might be within the academic institutions and currently available to an elite, perhaps, can be disseminated through technology across the world to the poorest and to the most remote. Even where there is not an internet connection, we're finding that UNICEF, for example, are working on solutions. 
that can be put into those into those towns and villages and remote places to provide an internet like simulation where people can access education. And so the threat of AI and how it will lead to unemployment, it seems at the same time we face uh, another opportunity to disseminate education to the world in, in a way that has never been done before. And to an extent, a breadth, a scope, a depth, and a quality that has not been done before. And the cost of that is inexorably falling. And the value to those that invest in it is inexorably rising. So we, we're in a, in a moment of great opportunity to close this thing. And I hope that this conference will show us how human security for all can actually be delivered and technology, how it provides an enormous opportunity. And regardless of the obstacles placed in its way by various governments and various factions that may choose not to push out the education, that they are fighting a futile effort. And, and the security that we seek is very possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin.